area and I said start holding my calls, filter my calls, people would get mad because just because you call me don't mean I have to call you back. Somebody else may return your call. Somebody else may take care of it. Because sometimes I am trying. I am in the middle. You don't understand. Sometimes people are in the middle of the fight of their life. They do not have time to let one little thing drain them. Because one little thing could knock off what God is doing in their life. And I have to protect what God's doing in my life more than anything else. My wife, my family, my destiny, my children, my ministry is more important to me than your friendship. Really? That's why Jesus, you say Jesus was love. Then I know he was. That's why he told the Pharisees, you're like white and sepulchers full of dead men's bones. With love. <laughs> Number four. Is this all right? We're almost through. Hallelujah. Spiritual warfare. Number four. Satan's seasonal. Say seasonal strategy. The enemy and God operate in the realm of timing. Say timing. You need to learn the difference, and you can write this down, between chronos and keros. Chronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S, chronos and keros, K-A-I-R-O-S. Chronos is where we get chronological time. The sun, the axle, the seasons, the watch, chronological time. Keros is God's timing. God could have decreed something about you 10,000 years ago and you weren't even born yet. But in God, God is eternal. God sees time this way, laterally. We see God time horizontally. God looks down and sees time. We look forward and backward and see time. Am I making any sense? And you need to understand God operates in timing. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean you're not in the will of God. I've had people say, oh, the Lord called me to, to China or the Lord called me to Africa. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go buy a ticket. And I look at them and say, do you speak Chinese? <laughs> well, no, but I'm going to China. I'm a missionary. What you going to do? Sell flowers? I had a girl, that, 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 let's, just, let's, get, let's just get practical. I think you'd understand this. You're a missions church. I had, <laughs> I had this guy last week. It's the pastor's son. The pastor took me aside and said, my son wants to talk to you. And he, he told me his burden for this foreign country. It's an exotic foreign country. And he's single. And this foreign country is known for beautiful women. So I don't know if it's God or but anyway, he has this burden for this exotic culture. And I asked him, I said, do you speak Spanish? And he said, no. I said, what's the language there? Spanish. I said, are they bilingual? Do they speak Spanish and English? He said, no. I said, okay. Because he was asking me, do I go? I'm wanting to go now. Then, he, then I said, what are you going to do when you get there? You haven't been to Bible school, but you don't have to go to Bible school. But you don't preach. Have you ever won a soul personally to God? The guy's about 21. Have you ever won a soul to God personally? Just you. Not your dad, not the church, not the bus, but you. No. Do you play an instrument? I play drums. Well, everybody in that culture plays drums. They don't need that. So are you, are you a contractor? Can, can, you build, can you build stuff? Are you a mechanic? What could you do for the missionary? Could you fix their cars? Are you a teacher? Could you teach the missionary's children? I went through a whole list. When I got through... He couldn't speak the language. He had no skills. But he was called. <laughs> I don't doubt his calling. I doubt his kairos. I doubt his timing. Here's what I said do. I said you can go over there and probably lose your soul. Or you can prepare yourself and take the next three to four years. Learn the language. Learn a skill. Call the missionary. Find out what their greatest need is. And learn how to fix it. And then go over there and do something for the glory of the Lord. Does that make sense? People come over and say, I want to be a missionary. What can you do better than we're doing? If you can do it, help us. But if not, leave us alone. We don't need to babysit you. We need to have revival. So, I, I, yeah, I thought you might understand that. Whoo, it's tight, but it's right. <laughs> so, and I looked at it. And what was funny is when I got through, his whole family was mad at me. His dad and everybody. It's like, we thought you'd be happy he was called to be a missionary. I said, I am. Well, we thought you would understand. I do. 
When we went to Africa, I didn't speak the language. I was a teenager. I didn't speak the language. It took me six months just to hardly say hello. Okay? I would go to church services. I didn't have a clue. They were French and other African dialects. What good was I until I learned the language and learned skills? But what God did do, he gifted me to speak the language before my father. So I became, after six months, now this was a miracle. I was in French lessons for six months. After six months, we were visiting a village church. Now this is how God works. If your spirit's right and you're trying. I had French lessons every day, five days a week for four hours a day. French, not including my other studies. Poor me. <laughs> and at, we were at the village. They asked me to testify because they want to have the whole family because they love to see these fat white people getting up and all this stuff. So they had me get up, and I got up. I was a teenager, and I walked to the pulpit. I was already preaching. You understand? I was already preaching before I went to Africa. And I was preaching and traveling around by bus, couldn't drive or anything. I get up, and I hit the pulpit. The anointing comes. I open my mouth to say, Je vous salue au nom de Jésus Christ, and I'm just going to greet them in Jesus' name. And when I get up, the Holy Ghost hits me. And 20 minutes later, I come to myself and realize I've been preaching in fluent French. From that point on, it's documented, from that point on, I have always been able to preach in fluent French when the anointing is on me. But outside the pulpit, I had to keep going to school and learn. <laughs> and outside of the anointing, I just had to sit down and get my books out and study. And for years, I've had to study and had to learn to learn how to do legal French, business French, all of that. But when it comes to Bible French, what they call archaic French and preaching, I can go anywhere in the world and the anointing comes, I will preach under the anointing. But God didn't do that to me until I submitted to learn. Amen. Boy, I'm helping somebody here. I think I'm helping some young people. For the super, I've got a destiny. Get a degree. You're to help your destiny. You loved me before today. They, these people loved me before today. But after today, it's bad. I don't know what's going to happen. It's bad. Now, I know I sound ignorant. But I was telling Brother Timothy, I have 20 credit hours on my earned doctorate degree from a secular, non-Pentecostal university. Because I believe in studying and discipline. I just try to make it sound simple and easy. Because of what the Lord told me. Well, years ago, my dad told me this. He said, son, get an education and then get over it. <laughs> he said, learn to preach deep things in such a way that the most unlearned, uneducated person in the audience will understand what you're saying. So there's nothing wrong with that. So I wanted to tell you, I believe in study. I believe in discipline. But I also believe that once you do it, learn how to speak in such a way that you fulfill something and you do something with what God learns. Uh, Luke 4, 4 and 13, when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until, listen to what it says in the NIV. He left him until a more opportune time. The devil tempted him. Jesus said, the word rebuke thee. This is what the word says. And the Bible said the devil left him till a more opportune time. I'm coming back. And he always comes back when you're weak and when you're tired. Now, here we go. He attacks A in seasons of fruitfulness. Genesis 49, 22, 26. He will attack in seasons. Some of the greatest attacks I ever had as a pastor was right in the middle of revival. But the doji, I mean revival going like crazy. And my youth pastor's wife commit adultery. I mean people getting the Holy Ghost everywhere. And one of my leaders go nuts. And I'll be like, where did that come from? And then I realized the enemy attacks in seasons of fruitfulness. Then he attacks in seasons of sacrifice. That is why I try to tell people, and maybe I need to help you. How many of you have learned the hard way that you don't feel real victorious and real spiritual when you're on a fast? If you're going on a fast to feel, to feel spiritual, you're doing the wrong thing. Because fasting kills your emotions and your energy level and you will feel weaker and more dull and bored and less in tune with the spirit during your fast. It's after your fast when the strength returns and mixes with the sacrifice. But the enemy will attack you in the season of sacrifice because it's when you're weak. 